All right. So we got about 10 minutes before the official class start time, and I like to talk about the news in such dead time. So this one's pretty good, clean fun. Uh, so this guy went on Bug Crowd, I think, or let's see, it was a hacker one, hacker one. There are three or four of these companies that you can join as a hacker, and then you find vulnerabilities in products and report them. And if you are the first person to find a bug of the exact type they want, and you can communicate it clearly enough, you will supposedly get paid something. The people involved in this tend to be very, very frustrated. I've earned a very small amount of money with these programs. It is very annoying. Usually, everything you find is considered out of scope or too late, and most researchers feel like they're wasting their time. And, and difficulties abound. And here's an example of this. So Valve is a gaming platform, or Steam is a gaming platform. This guy found a zero day in Steam, and he told them, and they told him it was out of scope and they weren't going to fix it. And they locked the thread and told him he wasn't allowed to disclose it at all and they were never going to fix it. And he got fed up with it and just disclosed it outside Steam publicly. And after that, they decided that he had violated the terms of the hacker one and they kicked him out of the program. So when he found another flaw, he could not report it because he was banned from the system. And so now everybody's very mad and blaming the hacker one and Steam for being so bad. It is, it is a huge problem. And the uh, red teamers, the hackers that find this stuff, tend to see that themselves as just being abused. But there is another side. I mean, people who develop software and management are just trying to do their job, and they really do not understand security. And especially, they don't understand hackers, which are, in fact, very hard to understand. They tend to break the law. They tend to communicate badly. They tend to be angry about strange things and talk some strange language no one can understand. So, you know, it's uh, – anyway, there's a – Big kerfuffle going back and forth as people say it's wrong. This, I must say, I found lots of things wrong with banks and I, nobody would talk to me at all. There was no way to report anything to them except to contact the CEO on Twitter. So I mean, this is nothing new to me, but um, very slowly, especially since the Department of Defense now had two bug bounty programs, the largest companies are beginning to realize they need to have bug bounty programs. And uh, so, however, how to run a bug bounty program that's actually effective is not really a solved problem yet. And the hacker one and the other groups like that are trying to invent it, but there are a lot of problems as we move towards uh, improving the system. So Moscow had a blockchain voting system, which is kind of hilarious considering that their elections are 100% rigged anyway. I mean, put the Putin, that's why I was reading a book from my other class 160 and they say it is very wrong that Obama and Trump congratulated Putin on his election victories because it's totally fake. What he does is if, he takes any candidate that could actually compete with him and arrests them, and then lets some candidate that has no chance run against him and then brings the vote so he wins. So it's completely fake, and for some unreason, ungodly reason, they decided to make a blockchain voting platform for these fake elections, and they did it wrong, so it got hacked. So, as if it matters. But what they did was they used three 256-bit keys instead of a long key, and a 256-bit key is not long enough, so this guy found that you can crack it in like 20 minutes of computation on a modern computer, and they said, well, you know, they were planning to update that to a longer key. So, but anyway, it's interesting. Um, I made a blockchain voting system a couple of years ago to see if I could get it work, and I made it public, and it predicted that Trump was going to win. And I said, well, this is garbage and threw it away, because like everybody else, including Trump, I thought there was no chance he could win. He had no intention of winning. He didn't have a transition team. He, had, he was stunned when he won. He had not planned for that. This was a publicity stunt for The Apprentice TV show. He had no intention of actually being president, and it was uh, – Everybody was surprised when he won. Everybody thought it was Hillary's. Everybody in Trump's camp, everybody in Hillary's camp. Uh, I think it's a very strange time. Britain's going through the same thing, though. And so this one is kind of amazing. Uh, this ISP CenturyLink, everything went down for a day or two. And um, it went down because of broadcast storms, which are a really old problem from a really long time ago. So um, what happened here is... You had a single packet come in, which was then sent to a broadcast address, and it was misunderstood by their various devices and forwarded all the other devices, which would make extra copies of it and forward it around. This is a really old problem, like from the 70s, broadcast storms on networks, and supposedly it was all solved with protocols in the 80s, like spanning tree protocol and um, other ones to prevent it. And uh, it's not obvious to me what the mistake they made here, but somehow they managed to recreate a vulnerable system for a really old problem, mm. or packets bounce around and amplify and flood the network instead of uh, getting resolved. Anyway, so uh, there's that one. 
Uh, this this is uh, one of the advantages of communism. This is one of the famous things that they marched for a century ago. Communism was proud of women's rights. They were not going to be discriminatory. And this has led in Russia to a lot of women in technology because they've been a century of equal rights for women under the communist system. And so it's not like America where a lot of women are just entering the field now. And they, here they've been in the field for a couple of generations. And uh, so... There's, uh, they have very high statistics of inclusion of women in technology. I recently started working in Saudi Arabia, and I had a Liz who was working with me, and I wondered if she would have a problem with the status of women in Saudi Arabia, and she looked into it, and she found that 10% of companies in America are owned by women, and 30% of companies in Saudi Arabia are owned by women. So it's not at all the cartoonish picture that you get in the media that they just oppress the women over there. It's a, they segregate the men and the women. But that means, which is what happens to some extent in Russia, too, that means women have to run the businesses because they have to have businesses just to have women in there. And so that's why they were very, very excited to have a woman on the team because they want to teach at Queen Noor College and only women can teach there. So the uh, strict segregation means that there's a lot of employment in every field for women. Anyway, uh, so Russia, in addition to having a lot more women's rights than America, has, of course, a lot more respect for logic and coding. I mean, chess over there is the main sport the way it's football over here. And um, so they've beaten us for almost an entire decade in coding competitions. Uh, we do the pen testing competition and the cyber defense competition here and a few other like that. But we're not been doing the coding competitions as far as I know. That would be the CS department. Uh, but if you do the coding competitions, um, you lose to the Russians. They're way ahead of us, which is not a surprise to me. The best Russians are very, very good at logic and coding and command line and such. Anyway, um, there's a lot of supply chain attacks. This has been getting a lot of attention for the last year. There are a whole series of these. Um, you could argue that the first one of these was Hartley. So in 2014, Hartley came out, which made all Linux machines leak out secrets and all the um, top executives asked, why are we using this garbage? And it turned out that if you used Linux for your servers, instead of paying money for them, you were using code written by random people in foreign countries never audited. Somebody in like Finland uploaded a defective software two years ago. Nobody looked at and using it. And the top executives were amazed. They said, wait a minute. You mean we don't even know who wrote this? Nobody audited it? We didn't pay for it. We can't sue or demand our money back or demand an update. Why are we using this garbage? And it turns out that we're all using that garbage. Even if you're using pay software, everything you run is using the libraries, and those libraries are using other libraries, and it's just hundreds of people are writing code that ends up running on your system, and it doesn't really go through any clear vetting or improvement process. And on top of that, the bad guys have caught on to this, and they are now deliberately subverting the supply chain. They are purchasing or hacking into small sources of a popular library and poisoning it, which will then percolate through the supply chain and affect products. And so it really would be nice if you could build your hardware with components that are only made in America, and if you could build your software only with code you wrote yourself, but nobody's in a position to do that yet. And so they're just beginning to enumerate uh, the source of this. There's a similar issue we've known about for years, which is uh, cloud sprawl. If you ask a company, how many copies are there of your all important data, whatever it is, uh, patented information, credit card numbers, you say, how many copies of that data are there and where is it? Most of them have no idea. It's on the server, it's on the backups, it's in the Dropbox, it's on thumb drives, it's in people's personal email, it's on their phone, it's on their home system. They say, well, if you want to secure something, the first thing you have to do is inventory it. You should know where your data is. Then we can start talking about how to protect it. But it's the same issue here. You say, where is the code that you're writing? Where did it come from? And the answer is not, my staff wrote it. Not even close. Your staff wrote 10% of it, and you're using all this stuff that came from God knows where. And so uh, there was uh, 12 packages you know, were backdoored and discovered recently, and there's been a bunch of these, either bugs or deliberate malware added to code, which then finds its way into all sorts of other code. So uh, this one's pretty amazing, especially since I'm teaching a lot of Splunk. I've just set up a new Splunk server today, and we'll have a big Splunk project in most of my classes. Um, and this one looks like a Splunk flaw. So MoviePass exposed a lot of credit card numbers. And what I expected this to be is the most common thing. They had a database and they put it on Amazon with no permissions because that's what's been for like the last two years. Because the default when you move to the cloud is to put your data in a database on the Amazon cloud server. And by default, it's just open to the whole world. Unless you know to turn on security, there is no security. And that's why they keep finding open buckets. But that's not what this was. He has a screenshot, which I found very interesting. 
What this is is Splunk or perhaps Elasticsearch, which is very similar. This is not a database. These are error messages. This is authenticate auth failure for login. When you have an error to log in, then it records a log entry and the log entry includes your password. That's and your or credit card number or some of the sensitive data. And logs are very frequently world readable because people don't realize they're sensitive. So their error logs are easily visible so they can diagnose things. And if you uh, get certified in installing and configuring Splunk, I teach that class and I'm probably gonna get more certifications in it. This is one of the things they tell you, you have to be careful who can see the log data because often log data contains confidential information, so you don't just broadcast it to the whole world, but that appears to be the mistake MoviePass made. Not quite as simple as just exposing their data directly to the world, they exposed their error logs to the world, and that has a similar effect. Anyway, um, so we're up to the official time here. So there's a handout, which I think may already gone around. Maybe I'm not the handout, sorry. Pass one of these out. And uh, so, this is exploit development, and I'll introduce it here, and there may be some people tuning in online. Yeah, we got six. All right, there's supposed to be about 30 people here, but uh, if they've taken my class before, then they will know that attendance is optional. You don't get any points for showing up, and you don't lose any points for not showing up. What happens is everything goes on my webpage. There's a live stream by Zoom, so you can attend this lecture, you attend this lecture live anywhere by clicking this link, and you can just watch the video later, and you can just ignore all that and read the book if you prefer. As long as you learn the material, that's all that matters. Your grade is determined only by homework projects that you send in my email, and by quizzes, which you take online in a Canvas system. So there's a Canvas system to sign up for here. Um, yeah, here. It is not the City College campus system. You have to make an account if you haven't used the server before, and self-register here, and then your quizzes go there. That means everybody can take this class, and people have been taking this class in foreign countries that are not students at the college at all. It's available to the whole world. Um, that's, uh, and this class will continue in that, um, in that spirit. My Splunk class is at CCSF. The official Splunk certification class was last semester, and I'm not teaching it this semester, but I, in fact, going to include a lot of Splunk in 152, instant response. We won't do the official certification track, but both my class will use Splunk a lot. So if you want to learn about Splunk, I'll cover it there. If you go to my old classes, though, the videos are up, and all I did was go through the official free Splunk class. There's a free class Splunk puts out to take you to certification, and you can take it any time. But uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Anyway, so um, all right. So that's the uh, so what this class is going to be is developing attacks. Uh, this it turns. Um, this is an attack class, and we are primarily going to focus on Linux. So I guess about half Linux and half Windows. But um, the point of this is, uh, you, this is the process of exploit development is you have a server, you find a vulnerability, typically a denial of service vulnerability. You just do fuzzing is the most common way you do it. You send random junk to the server until it crashes. When it crashes, you now have found a vulnerability. You found a denial of service attack. Now, denial of service attacks are pretty common, pretty simple, and not considered very important because, you know, you just put in some kind of filter to block them and then you keep going. What, you, what people are afraid of is remote code execution attacks where you can take over the server and run code on it. And exploit development is refining a denial of service attack and turning it into a remote code execution attack. That's what you want. It is not always possible. There are quite a few denial of service attacks that cannot be turned into remote code execution. For example, just a packet flood that uses up all the bandwidth in the network switches. That will deny service, but it doesn't ever let you take control of the server. So uh, there are plenty of others that cause a crash, but they don't, no one finds a way to turn them into remote code execution. But the ones that can be exploited, we're going to learn here the main ways that you exploit them. Yeah. And so uh, here's the topics are down here. So we're going to start with um, layer with um, layer seven attacks, or just attacks with high level languages like bash and SQL with code injection, the simplest ones. And then we're gonna do step buffer overflows and format string attacks and such, first on Linux and then on Windows. And we're gonna do them all 32-bit and 64-bit. And in, my, in this class previously, we used virtual machines so everybody had to get VMware or VirtualBox running on their own machine. And that turned out to be extremely painful because for the last two or three years, those products have pretty much stopped working on modern versions of Windows. And a complete waste of everybody's time because the debugging they went through with those products is not valuable in the world. So I have abandoned that entirely and I moved to the cloud. I did this for Black Hat over the summer and it was a big success. So we are gonna do the new way, which is using Google Cloud Machines. So you have to have a credit card. 
If there are students that don't have a credit card, you can set up the local virtual machines the old way, and you may have to work in the lab or at some other place if your home laptop can't run a virtualization product, and we'll help you do that, but I strongly recommend not doing that. Use the real cloud. This is the way to do it. What we used to do is run a local machine in VMware Fusion or something, and of course you could still do that, but you're wasting your time because as it's been increasingly unpleasant. Um, if you run Kali in a virtual machine, even if you can run it at all, the tools never work, so you can't copy and paste, and it gets more and more annoying. So it's all for the birds. What you should do is use the cloud. Google will give you free cloud machines. If you put in a credit card, they will not charge the credit card. You connect it to a Gmail account, and you get $300 of credit. You see, I have $234 left of credit on this account. And when you use it up, you just make another Gmail account and reuse the same credit card. I've done it about a dozen times. The only punishment is when your year is up or your $300 is gone, they just nuke all your data. So you can't put real data up there, real servers you have customers using or anything, but they don't seem to care how many servers you put up for like trials. So this is awesome. And this is a good skill to learn. You should learn how to use the cloud. It would be most saleable if you learned how to use the Amazon cloud, but I can't get a lot of free service for everybody from Amazon. They're all big and bureaucratic. Uh, theoretically, we can be an Amazon partner and then official college students with an EDU address can get a very limited amount of time, but I don't want to restrict my class to college students. And in fact, we're having trouble even getting that arranged. Google is fantastic. You don't have to be anything. You can be anywhere except China. And the only reason you can't do it from China is not because of Google, it's because China blocks it. So you just have a machine, you create a machine. Here's a Debian Linux machine. You just click SSH and it sends the key up and gives you a command prompt right here and you can execute commands. And you can make Windows servers and have a desktop and install software and everything else. So you can totally do everything on somebody else's servers in the cloud and now it doesn't matter what you have. You could have an iPad or a phone or a Chromebook or anything. As long as you have a browser, you can do the work. So you can just make files up here and run them and you can do your projects up there and I love it because this means everybody has a high quality machine no matter what hardware they have. And uh, it's the same for everybody too. So I rewrote all the projects to needs to go in the cloud and I'm planning to stick with that. So anyway, um, if anybody wants to add, I'll have ad codes later. There's room for everybody, of course. And uh, does anybody have any questions? All right, well, let's, there's a schedule. Um, there are quizzes you can take online and there are projects to turn in. The numbers are sort of crazy and out of order because I renumbered the projects by topic and I'm using them in other circumstances. You have to send in images of the flags you find. The projects end up having flags. So let me just demonstrate one of them because uh, that is a little bit different than what I've done before. So for example, here you make a um, Google Cloud server. I put these up here for people who really want to make virtual machines because they have no credit card. So that's an option. But I, if at all possible, don't do that because that's the old fashioned clumsy way to do it. Do this. So you have to make a Google Cloud server. So you go here and make a free Google Cloud machine. And when, you, when you're done, you execute a command to get some information about your machine. And there's a flag covered in green here. So that's what you turn in. And so you have to capture an image showing the flag. And capture a whole desktop image that includes the clock in the corner. And the only point of that is then we can help people who get stuck halfway by looking at their screenshot. And we can tell if students are cheating and copying other screenshots, which tends to happen at colleges. So um, anyway, that's what you do. You send those in um, and the uh, email address to send them is on the homepage. Let me try and get this out of the way of the Zoom, which always gets in the way. Yeah, I wish there was somebody to get Zoom to stop using up the top inch of my screen, but I have found no way to get rid of it yet. Anyway, um, so yeah, you turn them in here, email them in to cnet.127sam at gmail. So that's how you do it. And you have quite a while to do it. I recommend getting started right away on the projects. And so I would, I rec by next week, you should do the first two quizzes and do the first project, but I'm not gonna punish anybody for being late yet because people might still be adding the class for several weeks. So you don't actually lose any points for being late until uh, 918, which is almost a month away because that's when the ad period is over. All right. And so all the projects and quizzes turn into a bunch of points and there's a final exam. There is no midterm exam and you can be elsewhere and come in by Zoom. And I'm going to be doing a lot of traveling this semester. So sometimes I will be out of town and tuning in by Zoom. I'll let you know when that happens. But anyway, um, that's, that's how you get points. And so there's a grading sheet I should mention for people who want to see the grading policy. It's the same thing I always have. There's a quizzes, projects, a final exam, 
a total number of points. 90% is an A and 80% is a B and 60% is a C and so on. Yeah? Are there 18 projects? Uh, that I don't really know. I'm still working on the projects. So that number might change a little. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to add more, but there's a lot more than nine. There's five here. Oh, there's a whole bunch more. There's a lot more than nine. There's something like 15 here. On what thing? This is what you get if you click the projects link. Uh, let's let me let me go through this. You go to 127, and then you click projects, and they're on a separate page here, and you'll see a whole bunch of projects. There's two there, four here, about seven here, about ten there, and another one down there. Yeah. All right. Good. I hope I don't have any on this page. I put them all on a separate page. And uh, those are lectures. And yeah, there are no projects on this page. They're on a separate page. Anyway, this is good. Any questions about anything? Yeah. So I get those points for the locomotion. You can do them both if you want to, and you will get points for both. I just you don't need to, but you can. That's fine. And a lot of them have extra credit portions, and uh, you can get more points on the projects to compensate for points you lose on the quizzes. And by the way, as usual, any kind of off-campus training event counts. If you go to a DEF CON or, or a Python meetup or something, all those things are worth extra credit, like I usually make it. So you can get points by attending other events. Just let me know about them. Like, uh, yeah. This is events that you post up, where you see, like, No, any kind of training event, just let me know. If related to security is good, any kind of tech event that you go to for training is worth extra credit. Because I highly encourage that. You should get out and meet people. You should get out and meet prospective employers and hear other voices. And I'm going to have a lot of guest speakers coming to class to talk to us because you really need to hear about the real world out there. And the real world of employment is much bigger, of course, than what's in the class in the textbook. Yeah. Yeah, the speakers will be sharing mostly by Zoom. So you can tune into it from anywhere. And we'll... You, yes, you should be able to tune in by Zoom, and uh, they'll probably put up videos too, unless they don't want me to. But I think the speakers so far are mostly happy with that. And you'll find them, the speakers um, at the time of this class here, and you can go to the other speakers. If you just scroll down, here they are. Here's one coming, and here's another, and another, and another, and I've got like three or four more in the pipeline. So um, it's worth extra credit to go to hear any of these speakers, or to tune in remotely in here. Good. Uh, there is a book recommended um, here, you, and it is pretty dense and hard to read, but the lectures are based on the book. Um, and I recommend doing what you can to read this book. This is the Bible of the field. It's about a 10-year-old book, but it is the basis of all these attacks. It's just a little complex, a little bit like a math book. Um, but we are going to cover part of this book. And so the best thing is to get this book and read it. Some people prefer to like hunt up blog posts to read instead or something or just try to understand the lectures. But this book is where you find the written version of it. And most students are better off if they read the book and the lectures. Any other questions? Yeah. About what? The key. The key? Yeah, if you down. What key? You mean the lectures? Oh, that's just, oh, that's just Keynote. I use Keynote instead of PowerPoint. So yeah, that confused. It's not a cryptographic key or anything. It's just a Keynote file. And this is a slide share file, which is PDF. Good, good. Yeah, there's, you don't need a cryptographic key for any reason or any. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you have to give a bird's eye, like very tough, you know, about what we are going to do and then we will and then uh, what time this they will go there. Uh, okay. Uh, in this class, what you're going to learn is how memory is used at the binary level. And we are mostly, we're going to write almost no code. We're going to write little tiny short C programs, or maybe five or six lines, just to create a vulnerability. And most of those I just give you to use. And then we're going to write little tiny Python programs to perform the exploit. And those are incredibly simple. All they are is a print statement that prints a bunch of characters, and then they have some non-printable binary characters in it. That's pretty much all there is to it. And we'll use Metasploit to make some of the shell code. And we'll use other tools like debuggers and Mona to make the attacks we need for Windows. So we're going to be using tools that do the work. You do not have to really write any code in the normal sense. You don't have to like have if statements and branches and conditions or anything like that. Our code is just very simple because we're not really analyzing big complicated code bases. We're showing how to, vulnerabilities occur and how to exploit them in a simple case. 
And the main thing is to see how to exploit them in Linux and Windows. So the projects are the heart of the class. So first we do command injection, where you're injecting bash <laughs> or SQL. And that's where you don't, your code is in that language, just the bash command line or SQL. Then you do binary exploits and the code you're injecting is actually machine code or assembly code, but you use a tool to make it and you don't have to read the assembly code very much, but you have to read a little bit of assembly code, which you'll see, but you don't really have to write any assembly code in, your, in the formal sense. And then we do it all on windows and that gets actually pretty easy um, because we'll, um, Windows has a lot of graphics tools, which confuse people less than all the command line tools we use on Linux. But that's basically what we're going to do. And then there's at least one ARM project where you can see ARM assembly because ARM assembly is coming. All the Internet of Things devices are running ARMs and cell phones are running ARMs. So Windows, we want Windows and Linux, 32-bit and 6 bit That's most of the course. But we have a little bit of ARM because you should also know how that works. And it's very much the same principles, but ARM assembly looks a little different. And it's good to get used to it. So I hope that helps. Is there one that's not Mac OS? Um, not particularly, no. Um, it would be a good idea, but I haven't got any projects yet exploiting the Mac. It would be nice to them. Okay. And the iPhone too, but I don't have them in this class yet. I see. And the question is, what version of Windows are we targeting here? What's that? What version of Windows are we targeting here? Oh, uh, these are all generic. They'll apply to any version. And mostly, <laughs> mostly we're going to use a Server 2016 machine in the class, but uh, the latest version. So uh, we're going we're gonna to be studying the defenses and overcoming the defenses in the latest version, um, at least some of the defenses. And so that's, I tried to get rid of all the old stuff and focus on the new stuff as much as possible. These are very good questions. Any other questions? All right, well, let's start with the first lecture here. We'll go through the first chapter and uh, then I'll do some demonstration of the first project or two and you can get started. So, um, all right, so the basic concepts of what we got here, you have a vulnerability, you have a of some kind and it has a weakness. If there is no weakness, then there's no chance of exploit development. Exploit development starts with some kind of flaw in the server. So the common one is denial of service. There is some kind of data you can send to it that causes it to crash. Uh, the other things you might have is elevation of privilege, where you can somehow defeat the authentication mechanism and become another person like the administrator when you shouldn't be. And what you'd really like is remote code execution, where you can execute arbitrary commands on the server. That's the most powerful, most scary exploit, and that's the one that bug bounty programs will pay for and people will freak out in patch because that's really bad and people can just take over the machine. These other ones people often don't really care about because they don't see them as that threatening. So an exploit is when you can take advantage of a vulnerability and do something. Uh, and so typically researchers will find a vulnerability and they will write a proof of concept, some kind of program you can just download and run that does something like launch um, calculator or put a message on the server or something just to prove it's vulnerable. That's what the white hat hackers do. They don't actually steal the money or destroy the server. They put a mark on it in a controlled way and everybody can run it against their server and see if it's vulnerable. That's the, what a proof of concept is. And that's where we're going. We're going to find a vulnerability, refine the exploit and be able to create a simple proof of concept. And that's, that's as far as we go because we're white hats. We're not really trying to develop a real a ransomware tool or something that can hurt people. We're just trying to demonstrate the vulnerability which then you would report to somebody and they get a chance to patch it, or you offer it to people so they can test their systems and see if they're vulnerable. If it's not possible to patch it, which is often the case because the vendor doesn't bother to put on a patch or the product is old and the patches aren't coming anymore, or for some reason you can't deploy the patch in certain environments. This is the modern world. Many people have expensive hardware that's running an old operating system that's no longer supported, like the TSA uh, gun detectors are running Windows 98 with hard-coded passwords that can't be changed. And a lot of expensive devices all over the world are running really old computer systems that can't be patched. So you have to learn what their vulnerabilities are and put security outside them. Like put them on an isolated network with a VPN concentrator and a firewall protecting them. You have to put defenses outside the system instead of inside the system. Anyway, so zero days are attacks against which there is no known defense. These are attacks that nobody knows about. And this is the most valuable thing. And nation states, China has a lot of them. Russia has a lot of them. The NSA purchases them. If you find something new, like if you find remote code execution on a fully patched iPhone, that is worth a million dollars. That's why there are no public iPhone jailbreaks in years. There's one this week, which is very rare, just because Apple actually undid a patch accidentally. So an old jailbreak happens to work right now. They'll have that patch by next week. But this week, you can actually jailbreak your iPhone with, uh, with publicly available code. And that has not really been possible for years because that code sells in secret to military and 
possibly criminal gangs that will pay a lot of money for it, or mostly it's the NSA that buys it, and they, keep, they use it in secret to attack military targets, right? and they keep it secret as long as they can. And as long as it's a secret, it's a zero day, which is the scariest attack, which means your antivirus does nothing. You can read all the technical articles in the journals and do everything they say, and it won't save you. It's not in your intrusion detection system. There's no way to stop it because you don't even understand it. And once somebody finds it, like an antivirus company, and then they publish an article and put it in their antivirus engine, now it's not a zero day anymore. Now all you have to do is update your stuff and you'll be protected. So its value is destroyed when you get caught. So people hoard these like secrets and use them carefully against their, and try to keep them secret as long as possible. Anyway, so fuzzers are the main tool you use to find new vulnerabilities. You could, in principle, find a vulnerability by just reading the source code of an open source project and detecting flaws, and that's one way to do it. But the most common situation is you're attacking pre-compiled code. You don't have the source code, and you, what, you use fuzzing, where you just send randomly uh, defective traffic to it. If it's network traffic, you typically send long packets, um, packets with unexpected bytes in the middle. If there's any kind of numbers, like the length of a packet, you try giving them negative numbers and really large numbers. Just try all sorts of uh, unusual data in the hopes that some of them will hit some condition that the programmer didn't plan correctly for, and now you get some unusual results. Uh, so we're going to mostly do 32-bit code and 32-bit attacks, although I think that's no longer true. I think about half of this is now 64-bit. I just updated the stuff. So uh, I think 64-bit is now getting fair treatment of about half the exploits. It's really pretty much the same as 32-bit. There's only a few minor differences. And um, so what we're, almost all of our attacks are memory corruption attacks. That's the most common type, where you have some ability to write to memory in an unexpected way, which causes the computer to misunderstand the contents of memory. And that's how you inject some code and you trick it into running your code. Uh, the most common one is the buffer overflow in the stack. You can also have buffer overflows in the heap. You can have dangling pointers. These all do about the same thing. You get an opportunity to write to memory where you're not supposed to write to memory and you trick the computer into misunderstanding something. The fundamental problem which causes all these exploits is a severe weakness of hardware. And this dates all the way back to the earliest days of computing. There's eight bits in a byte and the same bytes are used for many purposes. So machine language instructions that are executable are just 8-bit bytes. Text is just 8 bits byte. Images, movies, everything is just the same kind of bytes. So you can send up something like a password. It's just supposed to be characters, and then you can run it as code because the same bytes can be interpreted one way and interpreted the other way. And that is fundamentally stupid, and I always wondered why they did this. And one thing I wondered, why don't they just have 12 bits in a byte and four bits are there to indicate the purpose of this byte. And now a code byte is different than a data byte, and it would never be confused. And that is, in fact, what the latest mitigations are turning into. Uh, that is turning it, versions of that are coming in the next generation of Intel and AMD architectures, where there is a second register that refers to the purpose of each byte. And as we'll see, modern Windows and Linux systems have permissions on memory segments to begin to do that or you mark the data segment so it is different than the code segment. And so even if someone manages to inject code in that segment, it won't run. And we're getting there slowly. But the fundamental reason why all these exploits work is that you feed in data that is interpreted as just harmless data like an image, and then you trick it into running it like code later. Anyway, so there's an address space when you launch a program. Your program starts on, say, the hard drive or a thumb drive or an SSD. When you launch it, the operating system copies the data from the SSD into RAM, and then it runs it in RAM. And what it does is it creates memory segments. So here's some text segments for Windows programs. You have the text section, which is not readable text. It's assembly language instructions that run. This is the executable stuff. Then you have data with variables and the uh, basic stack segment with other variables that are used. These are writable, but not executable on Windows systems. And this is executable, but not writable. That's the fundamental W or X. Write or execute is the fundamental Windows security model and has been for 10 years or more. Every memory section is either writable or executable, but never both. So any place you put data cannot be executable, and, any, and the code you're executing cannot be changed while it runs. So you cannot have self-modifying code. Now, it is possible to write programs that break these rules, but you're violating Microsoft best practices. Most commercial software does, in fact, obey these rules. And those rules would protect you against these memory corruption exploits if you didn't find ways to defeat them, which we will. The stack is the fundamental place you target attacks. 
The entire purpose of the stack is to make it possible for a routine to call a subroutine and another subroutine and then find its way back like a dream within a dream. That's why it has this weird last in first out structure. You store data on the stack, then you call a subroutine. You store more data on another frame on top of that one. Then you call another subroutine, you have another frame on top of that. And when you return, you pop the data off the stack to enter this, the routine in the middle, then you pop that data off the stack and return to the main program. Then you, when you close the program, you pop that data off the stack and return back to the operating system. And the stack is designed to have this last in first out system to support exactly that process. Subroutines that call subroutines that call more and more subroutines and typically you're 30 or 40 layers deep in the running system. This turns out to be the main process that we are gonna hijack, the heap is an unstructured place to put data that does not have this last in first out structure. You just allocate blocks of space, store data in it, and they can be any size, they're just in an arbitrary list, and you use them and when you're done, you deallocate them, and it doesn't have any of this pattern where there's last in first out. It's just arbitrary lumps of data stored there for anything you wanna store temporarily that you don't wanna keep storing for the entire duration of your program. Um, so here's what programs look like in the layout in RAM in a simple way. You have the heap here, which grows up. You have memory back here, and the stack grows down towards lower memory. So your stack has a memory address, and when you call a subroutine, it goes to lower memory addresses and puts another frame of stack data here. And when that calls another subroutine, it puts another frame of stack here, and the stack grows down. There's a limit to how much room you can have the stack, and when you hit the end, you have an error. You have exceeded the bounds. You're not allowed to make the stack any larger. It has a limited size. And the heap also has a limited size, and there are other segments. Every program needs to have a um, text segment that includes the executable code, and it almost always has a data segment of some kind, and they almost always have a stack because you want to call subroutines. They may not use a heap, but the operating system will typically allocate a heap in case they want to use it. And they can have as many segments as you want, but these are the basic segments you'll almost always see and we will see them explicitly in Linux and Windows. So I got some cahoots. Um, let me bring them up here. These are just in-class quizzes that are worth extra credit. You don't have to do them, but it helps prevent people from falling asleep so much. That's all it's for. So I got, they're trying to get money out of me, which they are not gonna get. And there should be favorites someplace. Favorites, there we are. And this is 127, 1A, which is here. All right. And it's going to randomize them correctly, so we should be in business here. And there should be the glorious Kahoot music. There it is. Okay. So go to Kahoot.it and put in that number. And you can participate in this quiz. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. But if you do, you have a chance for winning three points by being one of the top three performers. set up some place to put the results. see if we got any more. They're still coming. Okay, good. All right. I guess I'll wait another five seconds. See if anybody more is coming. Guess that's it. Okay. So, an attack with no known defense. That's a zero day. You, you rate it by how many days it's been since the patch. And zero days are ones where there is no patch available. All right. So, if you send random data to a target, what are you doing? 
That's called fuzzing. All right. All right. So which section has this LIFO property? That's the stack, last in, first out. All right. Where are the machine language instructions for a program? The commands that the processor executes. Okay, they're in the text section. That's got a strange name, but that's what it's called. All right. And which section is read only? That's the text section. All the others contain data which changes during execution or can, but the text section contains the commands and you are not allowed to write code that changes the commands while it's running. That's self-modifying code and it's not permitted in most modern operating systems. So, I've got Rich P, I know who that is, and I think I know all these people. Ken, Tan, and WITB we know from before. All right, I think uh, my grader knows who that is. All right, so um, we got time to do another section before we take a break here. So, let's talk about assembly. This is the part that people always freak out about because it looks a little bit like math. Assembly code is the fundamental commands that operate on your processor, and at first it looks familiar and confusing, but if you just don't panic, it's not that hard, you get used to it. There's different kinds of, this is the hardware language built in the processor, that's called machine code, and assembly code is the attempt to make it human readable, which doesn't make it all that readable, but it's better than just having raw hexadecimal numbers. 32-bit uh, Intel is the most common 32-bit code is the case for most malware and a lot of applications. Now a lot of it is 64-bit Intel, those are the classic PC and Mac hardware systems. A lot of people are now moving up to ARM, and there's other things like MIPS and PowerPC that are pretty much in the history. Um, so anyway, X64 machines can run X32-bit 30, programs on Windows or Linux. Windows machines, by default, can run code that's a whole architecture behind. So you can run 32-bit code on a 64-bit machine, and you can run 16-bit code on a 32-bit machine. Linux, by default, cannot do that, but all you have to do is install an optional library to allow it, and we'll be doing that in this class, because all the cloud servers are 64-bit. And for half the projects, we'll be running 32-bit code on them, which you can totally do. All right. Um, so assembly instructions look like this. Move ECX 0x42. You have a mnemonic, which is the first part, which is like the verb that says what it's going to do. This will move something. And this moves destination source. This is the more common, I think, Intel format. There's Intel and AT&T. This might be AT&T. I always forget which one is which. But one of them puts they differ in where the source and destination is. And the way I tell is I look for a fixed number like this, 42. 40, you can't put any data in 42. 42 is the data. So this must be the source and that must be the destination. The ECX is a register, the C register that can store data. So this puts the immediate value 42 into the ECX. And the 0x in front of it means it's a hexadecimal 42. So it's not really 42 in base 10. It's 4 times 16 plus 2, or 66 is what it really is. And it puts that value in the register ECX. So that's the game here. Now the move, ECX, is B9 in hexadecimal. So the actual binary instructions in the machine are this, B9 42000. It takes five bytes to store this instruction. The B9 is the code for move something into ECX. And this is the number 42 in hexadecimal. And unfortunately, this is one of the irritations that we're going to deal with all semester long, is that Intel is little endian. They put the least significant numbers here, and then the more significant, more significant, more significant. So it's the opposite of the normal way we'd write a number, like 142. We put the most 
the highest value on the left, but until you put the highest value on the right. So they get used to that. So we'll be constantly reverting version bytes to go in the wrong order because that's the way Intel is designed. All right. That's called little Indian. That's the way it is. If it was big Indian, you would write 42 this way. You'd have zeros on the left and the 42 over on the right. And that's the way you write normal integers. And you, you could have big Indian hardware, but in fact, all the hardware we're using is little Indian for some reason, just to give us a headache as far as I can tell. And if, if that isn't confusing enough, network addresses are actually big Indian. And other numbers are little Indian. So it's not even consistent, just to make you cry. Anyway. Um, so here's an IP address, like the loopback address, 127.0.0.1, and that actually is sent over the network in that order. But it's stored in RAM in little Indian form. You have to send it in the right order over the network because the network protocols expect to see that address in the right order, typical big Indian order. All right. You can have different operands. You can refer to immediate values like 1 or 2 or 42. That's just an obvious fixed number. You can refer to registers. There's EAX, EBX, and ECX. Those are the 32-bit registers. There are others. And you can refer to memory addresses. So if you put a bracket around EAX, it means take the number in EAX as an address in RAM and point to there. And your RAM, of course, you have 4 gigabytes of RAM or something, so there's a lot of memory for that. So here's the registers. Originally, there was only one register called A when I started this back in the 80s with 8-bit processors, and then they extended it, and then they extended it again to get 32 bits. So we have EAX. This is the A register, B, C, and D. Those are general purpose registers that can be used for anything. So they just contain temporary scratch pad information used during calculation. The most important things to us are going to be the EBP, the ESP, and the EIP. The stack, every Whenever you're in a routine, you're in a stack frame, which stores the local variables for that one routine. And it goes from ESP is the top of the stack and EBP is the bottom of the current stack frame. And all the local variables are between those two. And we are gonna mostly be doing stack buffer overflows and we'll be paying attention to these numbers very carefully to learn how it works. And the goal of our exploit developer is to gain control of EIP. That means that's the address for the next instruction to be executed. And if you can control that value, then you can control the execution of the program. That's ultimately your goal. And as we'll see, the stack of our overflows are where you start and the most common because stack of our overflows make it in fact very easy to take over EIP. All right, so those are the registers. Um, the instruction pointer is the one that actually controls the processor. Um, so for 32-bit machines, the registers are all 32 bits in size. For 64, they're 64 bits in size. All right. Um, you can actually refer to a 16-bit portion of the register or even an 8-bit portion of the register. This is not done very often. Um, you could do it to run like 8-bit code on there or something. But anyway, um, it's, a, it's used. We'll see it used a little bit in shell code just to avoid having bytes that contain zero. But it's a very rare to worry about this. You typically just use 32-bit values. All right. So you've got multiplication and division. You've got addition and subtraction and all that jazz. Uh, there are flags that store whether you had the last result was zero or whether something overflowed and had a bit higher, like you added two numbers and it turned into a 33-bit number. There are flags to store that, and that's what you use for branching. Branch if something is big, branch if it's small, branch if it's greater than zero, branch if it's equal to zero, and so on. So there's a zero flag and a carry flag and a sign flag and a trap flag. We'll use that when we get to the debugging section. You can put traps in, which are conditions that pause execution to debug programs. The instruction pointer contains the address of the next command to be executed, and that means this controls the flow of the program. So if we can take control of that, then we can easily take control of the machine, and that's mostly what we're going to do. All right, got a few cahoots about that. And we're done with this one, and we are up to 1B, which is here. Okay. My cahoot is loading.
right. I got 17. I'll wait a few seconds to see if we're getting any more. Uh, apparently not. All right. So, what's the assembly language that malware is written in typically? <laughs> it's mostly written in 32-bit code, which is x86, because it can affect both 32 and 64-bit machines that way. All right. So the loopback address is written like that. What kind of notation is that? <clears throat> That's big India. The big thing's on the left, 127.001. All right. What is move and an XOR? <laughs> Those are mnemonics, they call it. All right. If you put data in EAX, what kind of operand is EAX? <laughs> That's a register. It's a little piece of storage right on the processor chip itself. It is not part of memory or the memory address. EAX is a special place to store data temporarily within the processor itself. All right, and if you put brackets around EAX, what kind of operand is that? <clears throat> That's main memory. So EAX is now an address, and you store it at that location in main memory. So it's a memory address. All right. And so, let's see, I've got Kirk. I think that's not really Kirk, because I think he left. But anyway, uh, WITB World has won twice. And we have Little Andy, and these guys will have to tell me their real name if they want to get points. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, we are... 6.53, I think what we ought to do is take a break. There's a little more of this lecture, and then I just want to demonstrate the first couple projects and get you started. So let's just take a, a break until like 7.05, and I'll uh, turn off the recording, but leave this going, and I can hand out ad codes to anybody that wants them um, and re resolve any questions, but I won't do the rest of the lecture for about 10 minutes. So let me pause the recording. <clears throat> And let's do a little more of this stuff. There's a little more of this chapter to talk about. And then I just want to demonstrate the first couple projects. So, all right, so here's some instructions. Move is the most common instruction. You move from a source to a destination. So uh, the Intel format is what Windows developers use with the destination first. So that looks like this. You move EVP into ESP. All right. Um, and then here's some move examples. This moves EBX into EAX. This moves 42 into EAX. This moves the contents of this memory address, 4037C4. Whatever's in there goes into EAX. This takes whatever's in EBX, interprets it as an address, fetches that address from memory, and puts it in EAX. And this does the calculation EBX plus ESI times 4 and puts it in EAX, and this is what you'll typically see when you're copying something like an image into an image buffer, because the bytes are numbered by bytes, but they're used four bytes at a time as 32-bit words. So if you want to co copy a block of memory, you want to jump forward by fours. So you use a register like ESI to just count one, two, three, and you move 32 bits at a time from one location to another with commands like this. You'll see that a lot whenever there's a large data copy of a block of data to another location. 
Then there's a thing called load effective address, which takes this EBX plus eight and it calculates the address and puts the address in here, not the contents of the address. It's kind of screwy. The reason you have this weird command is because certain things that you might expect to exist don't exist, like move EBX plus eight into EAX. You can't do an addition and a move at the same time, except by this clumsy construction. There's compare. Um, well, that, that'll move, them. then there's, uh, all right, that's EBX, EBX, so EAX might be zero, EBX might be this, and if you put brackets around the EBS, then it refers to that location and the memory contents in that location. So you got subtract, add, increment, decrement, multiply, and divide, everything you might expect is available. And you can, NOP is the command that does nothing. It turns out to be very useful, just like zero is useful. Uh, we'll use it a lot in our attacks. The point of a NOP is you put in something like a thousand NOPs before you're in malware. In our attacks, we're gonna inject an egg. An egg is what you call the code you want to run. That's your exploit. You wanna trick the processor into running your egg. So what you do is you inject maybe a thousand NOPs before the egg. And now we, if you move the instruction pointer to anywhere in the NOPs, they call it a NOP sled, because the processor goes to NOP, 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 and then your egg. So if you aren't quite sure where you are in memory, you put in a big NOP sled, and then you, even if you miss by a few hundred bytes, your exploit will still work. So we'll see, we'll use NOPs a lot. The only purpose of NOPs for legitimate code is to fill in a couple of extra bytes between the instructions because quite a few instructions have to be lined up on a word boundary. They have to be an integral number of four bytes. So you might have to fill with a couple of NOPs to use up the gap. That's the only normal reason to use NOPs, but hackers use them a lot. The stack we've talked about, the last in first out. So ESP refers to the top of the current stack frame and EBP to the bottom of the current stack frame. And if that sounds abstract, you'll see it in concrete. They'll be using it a lot. And so you push data on the stack and you pop data to take data off the stack. And the current process uses only the stack between ESP and EBP. Uh, so call, when you call a subroutine and move into it, that uses the stack. It sets up a new stack frame with the prolog of the function and leave and return, return from the subroutine, popping data off the stack and returning to the calling routine. And that is the process return that we hijack to take over the machine. So if you call a function like printf, you're, you're, you have a command, then you print something out, you call the printf library function. So the first thing that happens is it has a prolog, which reserves space on the stack and allocates a new stack frame to store the local variables. And then it does the print. And when it's time to return, it goes to the epilog and that pops data off the stack and finds the stored instruction pointer on the stack, which it uses to resume where it left off. That's the process of how you enter a subroutine and return from a subroutine, and we'll go through it in great detail. And so you have a series of stack frames here, going up towards zero, the caller, the high-level program at the bottom, then the mini immediate one in the middle, and the more deep one down higher on the stack. And in that frame, you store, the ESP is here and EVP is here, so you store all your local variables, your array counters and strings and whatever you use locally, and then at the end, the last thing at EBP stores the previous EBP. And right after that is this old EIP. So when you're done with this process and you return, you put this EBP in EBP and you put this address in EIP. And now you're ready to resume where you left off. And of course, the buffer overflow comes from if one of these variables can somehow be overrun, then I can change all these values and change that return address to an address I put in, and now when it returns trying to resume execution, it in fact goes to the wrong place of my choice, and that's how you take over the machine. All right, so test or compare are ways to compare two things and see if they're zero or not, essentially how you perform an if in assembly language, and then you have a jump zero or jump not zero. So you do a test, and then you jump if the result is zero or you jump if it's not zero, and that's what is in C and if. All right. So every C program starts with main and in come perhaps command line parameters. And um, so key P is written in C. All the Linux bash commands are written in C. So this copies the file foo into the file bar. So it has three arguments. argv0 is CP itself, argv1 is foo, and argv2 is bar. All in, arrays in C start counting at zero, which is incredibly cruel. When I was a little child, they taught me to count things one, two, three, and for some ungodly reason, computer programmers count things zero, one, two. And this may sound like a small complaint, but it is a huge complaint. One of the most common vulnerabilities is an off by one error. Just because you start counting at zero, 
very, very often things are done the wrong number of times. You try to do it 10 times, but you actually accidentally do it nine or 11 times. That's one of the more common flaws. And if they just started counting at one, it probably wouldn't happen, but that's not the way it goes. So we're gonna make little C code and compile it and look at the assembly, and then we're gonna look at assembled code and read it. So you get used to reading simple things. So here, if you have an integer, and then you add something to the integer in C, here's how it looks like an assembly. You define a number, define word type where it contains a zero, then you move the number into EAX, you increment EAX, and then you move EAX back into the number. So it takes three commands in assembler to be one line of C. This is very common. Now you might like to just increment right in memory, and that could exist, but that is not one of the operations in the processor. And if you use an ARM processor, it's reduced instruction set, and so it takes even more instructions to add up to something. There's a smaller set of instructions, and you have to combine more of them to make a single high-level command. But that's what it looks like. Uh, to just add increment, here's what an if looks like. So I'm gonna have a number, if number less than zero, then do something. So here I define a number, then I move it into here, then I do an or of EAX with EAX. I could have done a compare or a test, but an or does the same thing. And the point of an or is it just um, does a, a bitwise or of one number with the other. And if any, if this EAX is zero, the result will be zero. And if it's any number other than zero, the result will not be zero. So I jump if it's not zero down here, and if it is zero, then I execute the code in the middle. So that is the assembler that accomplishes this. And as you see, it's generally the case that the assembler takes three or four commands to do one command of a high level language, and it's really not too hard to read, but you have to get a little bit used to it. Here's an array. I define an array with four values, and then I set value number two to nine. So here I set an array with four zeros. And now I move a two into EBX, and now I get the array location uh, offset by EBX, and I put nine into there. That's how it looks to uh, do it in assembler. Here's a triangle where I'm going to take um, width and height, and I'm going to um, calculate width times height and return that area. And so here's the only thing here is the multiplication here, width times height over two. You can see there's an imul command here where I combine two things. So I do some kind of calculation to fill up the registers and then I um, do a multiplication there. There's a multiply command and a divide command. You can see that this program is turning into quite a few lines of assembly and so on. And I don't expect you to like immediately spot that, but you will gradually, as you do this more and more, you'll get better at spotting assembler and reading assembler. At the beginning, you just know two or three lines of assembler and watch for them. Uh, that's enough to get started. But the more you learn, the more you can move into the really elite stuff like analyzing big pieces of malware and assembler and finding bugs in exciting things like iOS. If you can really read this, you read this stuff efficiently. All right, and I see a question coming in. Good, because I'm completely lost now. Yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> it's, 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 a lot of people just freak out and quit when they see anything like, mag, like math. Don't let it worry you. Um, you, you. You practice with it and you get used to it. But a, a lot of students have complained and said this is too hard and I should be able to have a game version of it or something. And um, we're really, that's essentially what you're going to see. And a lot of people just hate this and avoid it for the rest of their life and do something else. There's plenty of other things to do, like write high level languages like C or or Java or something, and then you never think at this level. There's only, this is a relatively esoteric skill to actually do the binary exploits. It's considered super elite and cool, and you're like awesome if you know this stuff, because a lot of people don't know it. It's like Cisco subnetting, which is also a little bit mathematical. It's not impossible, it's not really that hard, but it's not, a lot of people avoid it. Just like most Americans avoid math because they, it makes them feel bad because they were tormented in fourth grade. Anyway, um, but I recommend not avoiding this or avoiding math. Both of them are not that hard if you just uh, learn them one step at a time. Anyway, there's some cahoots here, and then I'll show you a few other things. But if you don't like that assembly, don't be, don't be too upset. We won't do too much of it.
All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. I think maybe two people gave up. That's fine. Ah, oh, they might be coming. It's fun when you have conference calls and people forget their webcam is on and you can see them falling asleep, <laughs> reading their cell phone and turning on movies and stuff. Anyway, so, there we go. All right. So. All right, so the instructions at the start of a function, what are they? That's the prologue, and that's what actually sets up the new stack frame. All right, so what mnemonic enters a function? Call enters a function. All right. What mnemonic multiplies two numbers? Okay, <clears throat> yeah, that's I mole for integer multiplication. I think there's actually floating point multiplication too, but we not going to bother with that much. All right. If you want to compare two numbers, what mnemonic does that? Test will compare two numbers. CMP will also compare them. All right. Which one serves a special purpose for buffer overflows? Nops. You have a NOP sled. In attack code, you would not have to find it in normal code very much. All right. And what mnemonic makes the stack smaller? <laughs> Pop removes the top item from the stack and adds, increments the ESP so the stack gets smaller. All right. So there's Rich and Ken and S. Weed. Is a winner good? All right. So let me just point you to a couple of the projects. And uh, by the way, one thing I might as well mention before I forget, uh, there was a discussion in the break about writing a custom Android app for the college. <coughs> and it reminded me, I will show you what happened to the University of Houston. The University of Houston wrote a custom app. And this is what happened to them. This app was for their alumni. The alumni are the most important people at the college. They're far more important than teachers or students. They are the people that fund the college because they've graduated and got rich and now they watch the football games and donate money to the college. So they write special things to treat them with luxury. So they wrote a special alumni app so you can get latest updates about the football scores and stuff. And here's how it works. You can search for someone with the first letter of their first name and the first letter of their last name and then find them and it will find all the people with the first letter of A in either name and just publish this information about them. And so when I saw this, I thought that's a little bit of a privacy invasion. You're not seeing information about people, but it's not too much information. It's not like a password or a credit card number. So maybe it's all right. But then I um, tried, when you log in, you have to know your alumni card and your alumni number. That's what passes for a password. So I ran this, this app did not use secure network transmission. It was broken HTTPS. So I was able to man in the middle attack it and read the data, which is what I did here. And so when you send the data, here's a, this custom app did this. When you're sending it, your first name and your last name, it sends this red command, substring of Houston user first name and substring of last last name. Now this is a subtle flaw, but this is a fatal flaw. Your app should send data to the server. 
It should send first name and last name, but this app sends a command to the server over the network. So I, this is command execution. I could change this command to another command and execute, this will give me code execution on their server. You never send a command to the server. You send data to the server, and it uses the commands the developer put on the server. You don't take commands from the client, and this does. So that is a clue that something is wrong here, but the next one is even worse. After it sends the name, the A and A up to the server, it sends a request of only 426 bytes, and the reply is 351 kilobytes. Every time you use this app to, to look up an alumnus, it dumps the entire database onto the phone, including everybody's address, social security number, credit card number, and password for everybody in the entire alumni database. And it does this over insecure network transmissions. So you have everybody's, and then when you log in, it checks to see on the phone if the number you type in matches the number for your record that it got there. So I have everybody's password. And, and they didn't, you know, I, so, I mean, I told them they took this down, they made an update, but this is the problem with custom code. If you like, especially if you have a student write it, you will often have a monstrosity like this, and often your staff is not competent to audit it and find these problems. In this case, I was actually able to report it to someone, and they were actually able to fix it, and they didn't just hit me with lawsuits and accuse me of stuff, which is usually what happens when you tell anybody about problems. Um, there's another one. There's an Indian app I use in my Android class called um, Equity Pandit, and it has one million users that are putting money in it. And it's like this: you can get anybody's password at any time. It sends when you log in, it sends your email to the server. It gets the correct password and sends it down to the phone, and then it compares it on the phone and it puts both the right password and your input into the log where everybody can see it. It's and it sends it over the network with no encryption. So it's, you can get in anybody's account at any time, and I told them they don't care. They leave it that way for years. A million people in India are using it for real money. It's horrifying. Equity Pandit. Yeah, you'll find here, let me bring it up. If you go to um, uh, Google Play, it's in my Android class. We use it as a bad example. If you know anybody that can, any, any clue of getting through to anybody, I told them years ago, and they just don't care. But there it, I don't know if it's government, um, Equity Pandit, should, maybe it, it's been up for years and hasn't been updated. There it is, glorious Equity Pandit, that's it. It generates wealth. Yeah, you could put it that way. Anyway, um, anyway, so let me just talk about some of the projects for this class. So if you go to this page, the 127 page, the projects are here. And so um, the first couple are command injection. So first you make a Google Cloud server, and then you can practice just doing some basic Linux things like creating directories and files and learning how to use basic Linux commands. And then you can do some command injection. So let's take a look at it here. Um, you can compile, here's, here's the simplest example of command injection. You'll see this in router configuration pages. In your router, there's a place to test your network connection. You put in an address and it will try to ping that address. So here, if you put in an address like the loopback address, and then send pings, it will test your network connection this way. And if you know what a ping looks like, you can see what it has done is actually create a command. And let me bring up the source code for this. I wrote this, and it's an example of how never to write things. Um, so ping.php is here, okay. And so if I should be able to open that here, and bring it in here. Okay, so this is my PHP code. This is a very common way people write code. Since the programmer, which would be me, is not smart enough to figure out how to perform a ping in PHP, they just take the address from the user and pay ping minus C2 followed by the address from the user and make a line of bash and then send it to the bash command processor. So I take one language, PHP, and I make a line of code and have it interpreted in another language. This is the kiss of death. This is what leads to command injection. What's happening is the bash command processor executes a line of bash code, which is partly from the developer and partly from the end user. So I can add bash commands to the IP address. If I do 127.0.0.1 semicolon ls, you can put two bash commands on the same line with a semicolon between them. And so it does the ping and then it does an ls. So that's command injection. I can execute commands on the server by just putting them in the IP address. 
And so there's flags on the server to find. And if you've done the project before where you practice some Linux commands, you can find more than the first flag. One of them is right there. The others are hidden and you have to use a little bit tricky bash commands to find them. So anyway, there's various flags to find. And here's some more examples of the same thing. The Image Magic Library is a Linux library used to handle images. It's the standard used by Linux servers for profiles in chat rooms and such. And I downloaded standard code, and that's what we have here. So I can send up images. So let's find an image someplace. Um, let's go to uh, images. I don't know. CCSF probably has an image somewhere on the page. Okay, so there's an image. Can I drag that image? How about this one? There, that one I can drag. Okay, so there's an image. It's a ping, a JPEG. Okay, so I got a JPEG. So if you want to send an image up to the server, let me uh, get back. Okay, then you go here and you browse and just send up that image, logo.jpg. Okay, so you upload the image and it's going to process it on the server. And I put here the command that was used. It converts it to a thumbnail. So there's a 300 by 300 thumbnail. I'm zoomed in so it looks big. And if you click the thumbnail, you see your original image. This is the kind of thing you'll see on image processing sites all over the place. And this is the command, which is part of the Image Magic Library. And the exploit goes like this. You take a file and you put in this text. This is the proof of concept written by the attack, the hacker that found this flaw. So you put in that text and you save it so it looks like an image file. So I'm going to call this ex.jpg. It's not a JPEG, but it has a JPEG file extension. Now I'm going to send that one up. So I browse to that one and send it up to the server and upload the image. And now it executes on um, this command, convert. And notice it prints hello and then the date. So let's take a look at that code. This code that I put in there works like this. The people that made the Image Magic Library decided to make it possible to change an image. You could add a background color or a block of color to your image. And you could do a fill command in text after your image. So they allowed you to include metadata. And then for some reason, they decided to make it possible for you to dynamically change the color. So you, the color would come from a website. So you can fill from a URL and you can give it a URL and it will fetch the color from that URL. And the way they did it is the same way I did the paint command. They used curl, which is the unit command to fetch thing and just put this data after the curl. So if you put in the right punctuation marks, you can put bash commands here like echo, hello, and date. And it will execute those commands. So you've got command injection on the server by putting commands in the image file. Because they made the same mistake I did, they used their original language, which is something like PHP, and they made a line of stuff and then passed it off to the second command processor, including data that came from the user. This is what leads to command injection, and it's one of the simple major causes of vulnerabilities. And there's other examples here, too, a series of these. That's a real one that affected a lot of servers. And here's another one that affected a lot of servers over and over again. By the way, I just found out City College is going to move to Drupal. And I was amazed by this because Drupal is a disaster. Drupal is an alternative to WordPress. It's open source. And there have been three generations of god-awful command injection vulnerabilities in Drupal. They called it Drupal Get and Drupal Get and Do and Drupal Get and Three. So I made a vulnerable Drupal site, so you can play with it. So what happens here, there's a website that's got Drupal installed on it in an old vulnerable version, and this is the proof of concept. You run this code, there's a page somewhere that has something to do with registering for an email address, and in that page, there's the same flaw again, so you can execute bash commands. And this one echoes a smiley face into a file called yourname.txt. So it defaces my server by writing a file. But once again, you can just add any bash commands you want here. The only limitation is this one will not let you send a greater than sign. So you have to use this pipe T to redirect output instead of the greater than sign. It's often the case that you can't send any bash command. There are some limitations, but you do have the ability to execute code. So you'll see this happen. Um, you can take over my server. And again, I've hidden some files on there you can find and read the contents of, and those are the flags. So that should get you started at layer seven. This is command injection, which is, by the way, the most uh, biggest vulnerability in the world. This led to the most problems. And the next part after that is the one that really has hurt people the most, which is SQL injection. And I'll demonstrate that next time. I think this is enough to get you started. Um, and after that, we'll then move to the binary stuff where you do it in assembly code. All the exploits we're going to do have the same general property. There's a defect in the server, and we are somehow able to add code and change how it runs. Here we're going to add code in bash. Here we're going to add code in SQL. And then we're going to start adding assembly code. 
but it's all the same principle. The developer left a hole and we're sneaking in extra commands which affect how the server runs. That's how it always works. So are there any questions about anything? Yeah. What's that? Oh, oh, uh, the project will be graded within a week. So when you email them in, you should get an answer within a week. And if you don't, then something will go wrong and let me know. I have a grading system that reads those and we, we make sure it's all done at least once a week. Good. That's a good question. Important to know. Any others? All right. Well, I'm going to stop the share. I'll post a video of this later. And um, if you want to work, I would say work in this room. I normally work up in the hacking lab of 214, but this semester you're going to use cloud servers that involve putting in a credit card number. So you should work in this lab. It's not safe to put credit card numbers up there. This lab is much safer because in this lab, these machines have deep freeze. So every time you reboot them, they're totally clean. So even if somebody infects them with malware or something, they're much, so if you're going to actually do things that involve credit card numbers, you should do it here. And this semester, you should all be putting in credit card numbers to get cloud servers if you can. By the way, how many students don't have a credit card? There's always a few, I think, but maybe I don't have that problem. But if that happens, one thing I have some people have suggested is there's some kind of thing you can buy for like 10 bucks that looks like a credit card. Those might work. I haven't tried them. If somebody tries it, they can let me know. Um, yeah, something like that. They tell me there's these things you can buy and you, it's not really, you don't really, it's not, you don't need to have money in it. It just needs to pass some kind of test. They're not going to take any money but it needs to pass whatever their validation test is for a credit card number. So um, there may be some workaround for people who really don't have a credit card. Yeah, credit card. Yeah, then those might work. I'd be interested if somebody wants to try that and let me know if it works. Anyway, I'm going to stop the share.